Today's lecture, Engaging Schools to Support the Local Community Expectations for Language Learning, will be given by Patrick Burrito. He is the coordinator of Tribal Initiatives for Dual Language Education of New Mexico. Burrito's presentation will provide an overview of how other indigenous communities have changed their perception of language use and engaged in an approach that affirms and renews an appreciation of their language within the community. Um, Wirito wrote, this renewed appreciation becomes the blueprint for schools to adopt and validate the community's expectations for language learning and help move the pendulum towards schools supporting the indigenous community's objectives. As coordinator of tribal initiatives for dual language education, he supports and works with tribal partner community schools to strengthen their indigenous language programs and reframe how tribal communities approach teaching their language in a school context for the next generation of speakers. He received a BA degree in Southwest Studies from Fort Lewis College and an MA degree in Educational Leadership from New Mexico Highlands University. And just on a note that I would add, he is also a practitioner of what he is here supporting. And so he has a family um, who he is raising in the language. He has a young son who's four right now, who is, who is learning from himself and his older siblings. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Patrick up here. Thank you, Patrick. Should I? Is this on? Okay. Can you guys hear me? Or should I use this one too? Okay. All right. All right. So, uh, good evening. Um, yat eh. Yat eh. Anosko. She yam tratnes zanin shle. Na kreide ne, but she chin. It is chin in the she chedo, trode chin in the she so I just introduced myself the way we would do it back home. Uh, my clan, my mom's clan first, my dad's clan, my paternal grandfather, my maternal grandfather clan. So, and of course I'm, I'm Dene or Navajo. And usually that's how you would notice if they wear a bun in the back, right? If you notice that. Um, so. This evening, I've been asked to kind of talk about the work that we're doing at Dual Language Education in New Mexico in terms of working with schools that are thinking about language, language program. And one of the things that we, that we come across is this term that people use, what we call language revitalization or language preservation. And I think one of the things that we have to really think about for those of you who are uh, native or Alaska native or, or speak a language other than English, right? Um, the thing that we're talking about, language revitalization or preservation, is something that as indigenous communities we are faced with. And it's something relatively new if you really think about it in our history. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, our communities weren't talking about language revitalization because the language was being used in the community. Language was being used in every, every aspect of the, of the community. And so I hope tonight's conversation talk is, uh, I'm not gonna be talking all the time. Uh, that's, that's not how we usually do our presentations because uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, thinking, just making you guys think about some of the uh, points that we're gonna be talking about, okay? So with that, um, I guess I better turn it on first. I'm gonna talk about how tribal communities have changed their perception of the local community language. And I'll, uh, you know, I'll talk more about that in terms of, of how we view our own language. And you talk about, you ask a, a, a little kiddo, like, why are you learning your language? It's because of who I am. But the question really becomes uh, if we don't, have a, uh, an appreciation and validation of our language, um, does, does that 
play into the children's thinking. In other words, the motivation to learn a language. In other words, if we say, I'm a, I want to learn the ne, because that's who I am, but then my community doesn't value my language, what does that mean? Right, what does that mean? And so how do you, how do you get young people to be motivated to learn their language and to learn who they are, right? If the community doesn't validate that, and yet they validate English, right? The English is the language of status. And the other thing is an approach, and an approach on how we're working with, with communities in school. Um, we're not here to say that we're the expert. We're not here to say that we're the knower. We're a learner as much as you are, as much as, as, as the school and the community. And the other thing is um, to engage the community in these conversations, what we call a renewed appreciation of who you are, of who we are in terms of our language, our communities. If you really think about it, our language and our way of knowing has, has sustained our way of life, our communities, since time of memoriam. You know, our way of knowing, our way of learning has sustained our communities for so many years long before there was even a conversation to get on a boat to sail west, right? 1492, all, before all of that, we had a community and our language was, was, was used, right, in every asset. And then of course, to help move that uh, uh, perspective, what we call a paradigm shift. The idea that schools should be saying, we're here to defend the community, not as the community to support us. That's a different way of thinking about things. And so you, you often hear schools saying, we don't have parental support because they're expecting the parents to support them when the communities are, should be saying, as a parent, how can I support you? Right, that's a different way of thinking. And so you know, those, those kind of conversation. But before I do that, I have to give kudos to who I work for because they pay, pay for my livelihood, right? Dual Language Education in New Mexico is a nonprofit organization, and our work is to support dual language education in, in the state of New Mexico and, and also in the country. And um, our, our strategic plan, of course, is to advocate for dual language programs, uh, to support instructional uh, capacity in terms of, of dual language education. One of the things that we, we talk about is uh, in, 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 in working with our schools is um, looking at PD, professional development. Uh, but for us, I think the approach that we take is professional learning. PD is I come in for one day and I tell you, here's some strategies you, just, you can use and then you won't see me for another year or two years. Professional learning is that ongoing support, that partnership that we come in and say, okay, how, how are things going? Are, 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 is, is, are you guys making any progress? If you are, show me, tell me, share that story with us. So for us, it's professional learning, right? It's not PD anymore. And of course, uh, supporting the advancement of dual language education. Dual language education, the way I look at it is, is, is an umbrella. Within that, there are different approaches. You can do one-way immersion, two-way immersion, indigenous language revitalization, and so on. But under the umbrella in those programs and those approaches, it, 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 there's a couple of things that are, I think that are very important to think about is language equity. Meaning that if we, if we view English here, you know, do we view the, the community language the same? Or is it like this? Correct? And if that's happening in the school, how is it in the community? And how is it in, within indigenous communities? And so th thinking about that. So if, if the indigenous community doesn't have that language equity and English is still here and their own community language is here, how do you, how should we expect ourselves to go into the school and say, you need to give us more support, right? And those kind of conversation. So of course then we do our conference every year and we invite you and, uh, uh, to, to attend our conference in Santa Fe. It's a beautiful place, Santa Fe. Old, old, old buildings and it has a long history. So, And of course in, in New Mexico we have chili, red and green chili, right Christy? So, up here, all you guys have is jalapeno. That, that's not chili. No, no, I'm just kidding. So with that, um, so indigenous language. Uh, I, I asked a question earlier, right? So what I'm going to ask you guys to do is to, to talk to someone that's sitting next to you. Okay. 
Uh, you might not be uh, aware of the community in terms of the community language, but I'm going to ask you guys to talk, turn and talk, you right? So, and I'm going to, here's the question. And, and what is the vitality, language vitality of your community? Okay. And if you don't under, understand the question, feel free to talk about that. What does that mean to you? Okay. What is he asking us? Okay. So I'm going to give you guys about two minutes. Find somebody you're going to sit next to and have that conversation. Okay. What is the language vitality of your community? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and bring you guys back to, uh, I know you guys are engaged in some good conversation. So let's, let's come back to finish your thought. So real quickly, um, maybe somebody on this side might just share what, what do you think is the vitality. In this case, I, um, I think I'm talking about the Tlingit language, right? Okay. Anybody from this side? Volunteer? No? Go ahead. Anybody on this side? Okay. Okay, that, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. So when we ask the question about the vitality of the language, it's really about how the language is being used in the community, right? So if your language is being used by all ages, from children to adults, meaning intergenerational, meaning if you have grandson and grandpa talking in the language, communicating, Talking is one thing and communicating is another thing. So in other words, grandma might say, do this and do that to grandson. That's not communicating, right? That's like grandson saying, she doesn't talk to me, she just tells me what to do, <laughs> right? So if that's the case, then your language is safe. You're okay. But let's say there are some students that that's use the language Right? But not in all domains. What we mean by that is speaking, listening, uh, reading and writing and comprehension, right? And then if there are some students. But then if the language is used mostly by parents and older adults, right? Older adults will be someone like me in their 40s and 50s, right? And then, of course, mostly by grandparents and the older adults. This is when you're looking at 40, 50 years on up. And if, if that's the situation, then your, your language is what we call seriously endangered. And you, you're the one that would know that. We don't know, I don't know that, but this is, this is what we talk about when we say the vitality of the language, how the language is being used within the community. And of course, you don't want to get to this point, right? This is what we're trying to stop. And so that's something to think about in terms of, of, of language revitalization. Where, are, where is our language? Where is the Tlingit language? Where are we you know, in looking at this? And this is something that Michael Krauss researchers, you know, they spend years doing looking at these communities, and that's how they categorize it. So something to think about, okay? Um, so that brings us to the question when we talk about language, uh, indigenous language. Are we doing it to produce speakers, or, right, is this the goal, is to have grandma, uh, grand, grandpa and grandson talking in the language, communicating, sharing the story, asking, you know, the, the communication back and forth, or are we going to take the language and put it in, in, a, in the context of school and start using content or teaching content, right? We begin to, uh, I guess, Americanize our language, right? Because if you look at this, it's the alphabet, right? For, for those of you that learned the language, we never learned the alphabet. I, I, my mom and dad just didn't tell me, ah, you know, then those are sounds, right? That's not how we learned it, right? We just learned it because we were immersed in it. 
So you, you, you think about these things. You know, I'm not saying this is right or this is wrong. I'm just saying these are things to think about. Okay. So what is the purpose? What is the goal? And, and, and something to think about. So give you another turn and talk. See, I'm not the only one that's going to be talking. So you guys, so find your partner again. If you want to find somebody else different, that's, that's okay. You know, give you guys another two minutes to talk. And here's the question. Our school and community value the community language the same way as English. Again, the community, right? Not, not you, but the community. If you have, if you, you know, maybe it's your home. Think about your home. How is, is language viewed? How is the English viewed? Because that's the language of status, right? That's the language, what we call the language of power. Correct? So give you guys two minutes. Okay, Gabish, go. Okay, let's let's come back to. I know you guys are engaged in good conversation. You know, these these are good. These are good things to think about and talk about. And then hopefully the idea is to keep this conversation going long after we we get on the airplane and go back to Albuquerque, right? So, so um, I'm going to show you some responses. The same question we asked to a community that we've been working with. Okay, these are actual community conversations where we have elders, young people, traditional practitioners, healers, medicine people, educators, teachers, professors from all from the community that are concerned about the language. And basically what they said was, is of course it's the net community that the language, our language does not have the same status as English, period. Boom, that's what they said. We don't see it. We are, we are the one that are, we shouldn't be concerned with the school. We should be concerned with our community. If we want equity, equity for our language in the school, how come we're not doing it in our community? First thing is first, is what they said. And the English is the choice of language at home. Grandma might be a speaker of the language, but she chooses English to communicate with grandson or granddaughter. But yet they're the speaker. And so they say, well, then why do you do that? I don't know. I just do it. <laughs> and, and so those kind of things. And then speaking your language is not seen as an asset. Having that perspective, that indigenous perspective. So in other words, when you, when you speak the language, Tlingit, I guess the question was, it, are you thinking in Tlingit? Is that a Tlingit perspective? Right. I don't know. That's for you guys to think about. But what they say is if you, if you speak the language in Dine, you think in Dine, right? And then uh, speakers are not re seen as resources, or they're not viewed, and they more, more than often are viewed as uneducated. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, you know, we don't want grandma to be part of this planning. We're talking about language. We don't want grandma. She doesn't understand, right? Those kind of things. But grandma has a lot of knowledge. Grandpa has a lot of wisdom. How do you tap into that resource, right? And then English is viewed as a language of power and status. And in a lot of cases, what we call the bully language, right? It's, it bullies everybody, right? You know, you, for some of you go like this, you know what I'm talking about. And of course, success is, success is defined by educational degrees and income status. The more money I make, um, and I have a bigger truck, I have a bigger house, all my kids have iPhones, Right, that's, that's success, right? And we often get in, trapped into doing those things. I have internet and you don't, what, you know, things like that. And of course, Western education focuses only on the student. But in Western indigenous education, it's student, parent, and grandpa. That's how we, that's how education is defined in our communities. But in Western education, they say, you, you know, only parent-teacher conference. Grandpa can't go. Uh-uh. Has to be parent. But Western edu indigenous education is different, right? It's intergenerational. And so that's the that's response. So here's another turn and talk. What are the challenges that face your school to teach the community language, not used to teach academic content? In other words, economic content would be science, math, right? That's what we're talking about. So let's say the community language. If you're to produce speakers, right? 
if you're to produce speakers? What, what challenges would your school face if, you, if you're going to be teaching the land? Because once you start to put the language in the school, what's the first thing that comes up? We need to do good in our scores. How is this going to support the academic achievement? Right? That's the first thing they're going to say. Anything that comes into the school has to support the test scores. The goal is to move that data up. But maybe if our language is not for that, right? So think about those things. Kabish, give you another two minutes. Go. Okay. There's the. Okay, I'll help you guys come back. Uh, for the, because of time, I'm gonna just kind of go through this presentation because there's, there's other things I think we're gonna touch on. And I know there's some good conversation you guys are having, uh, some of the challenges. There are a lot of challenges that face the school. And I've heard a couple here, like teachers, uh, teachers that can teach the language teachers that speak the language, right, and so on. So those are good conversation. Again, here are some responses from that community. Our young learners are entering the school not speaking their language. Therefore, their, their own heritage language is a second language. So if that's the case, then our teachers train in second language acquisition. Right. That's a good question. You see what I mean? So our, lang our, our, our young kiddos are, are not speakers. Their own heritage language is a second language to them. So are you trained in second language acquisition? Do you understand what that means? Right? It's an interesting conversation. Can't learn the concept or content if you don't understand the language. If you're going to teach me math in my own language, and if I don't understand the language, how are you going to expect, you know? That's, I don't know, can it happen? That's, that's, that's something you guys need to talk about or schools need to talk about. And of course, parents of young learners do not speak their own language too. You know, if you get one hour of clinket at school, then you're not getting it at home. Research says if you only get one hour of language, it's gonna take you 47 years to learn a language. I don't know if that's true or not, but I read it somewhere. So if you learn, if you're, if you're being taught Tlingit for one hour a day, and if you follow that for the rest of, you know, keep that going, and you're immersed in English, you go home English, TV's English, everything's English, then you come back one hour in Tlingit, then you go back one hour in It'll take you 47 years to learn language. Interesting, right? Interesting. And then the other thing is there are no intergenerational conversations. Um, parents or grandparents are, are forced to use English, right? So the question becomes, the purpose is, why are you teaching the language? Is it to communicate? Is it to talk? Or is it to learn math? I don't know. That's, that's something to talk about. And of course, communities are diverse. I'm sure that's how it is in your community as well. They're very diverse. A lot of different, different, different things that come into play, and of course, things like uh, Christian, Christian, you know, Christian faith, belief, and th different things like that, intermarriage, and all these other things. And of course, cultural concepts are are too too advanced for certain ages. So, in other words, kinders were being taught cultural concepts that were even young parents didn't even know. All right. So, how do you? What's age appropriate? to teach something at certain ages, and those kind of things. And of course, leadership does not view the language as a priority, language revitalization. Colonization is here, historical trauma is here, deal with it, get over it, right? That's telling somebody who has an addiction, you have an addiction, get over it. That's historical trauma, right? Where's the healing in that? People just say, just get over it, just deal with it. <laughs> but as indigenous people, it's hard for us to just to get over something that has traumatized us for so many years for some communities. Okay? So that leads us to the conversation about language environment. 
And here you have English in blue and in, in, uh, indigenous language in green. We are immersed in English, correct? Everywhere you, everywhere, even here, it's English. Here, even my talk is in English. We're immersed in it. So if somebody ever asks you the question, immersion doesn't work, tell them, why do you speak English then? It does work, right? If you do it correctly. And so, so let's say you have a home that speaks some Tlingit, in this case it's Tine, but then we're still immersed because we have TVs, we have phones. No matter how much we try to do it, we're still immersed, right? Then let's say you have another home that speaks only English. There's no Tlingit spoken, right? And say, let's say you have a, a, a 50 50 program, I mean, a three hours of Tlingit. But look at, looking at this, this environment piece, again, how long is it going to take our students to learn that language? If we're immersed in it, especially when you have kiddos that are coming from the only English-speaking homes, and how do you continue that support? So it's, it's a big challenge. These are some of the challenges that schools face and communities face. And parents are looking at this. Young, you, young people know this. You know, we're, 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 we're there. This is a reality. Language revitalization is here, right? And so that's what we're talking about. So that's kind of gives you an, uh, uh, from here you can have more conversations about this, more conversation. What can you do as a parent? You know, if you're on this side of the, of the, of the language environment, how do you get yourself on this side, right? And, and so on, okay? So here's a quote that was made by Dr. Larry Emerson. He says, to not speak your language is a form of trauma. Not just trauma, but unresolved trauma. Hmm, what does that mean? So when somebody says to you, historical trauma is here, deal with it, it's still unresolved. Right, what's unresolved? So here's a comment that came from a young language learner. That the question was, what's the biggest challenge if you don't speak your language? And the, and the person said, not being able to communicate well with fluent speaker. Wow. Okay, so how does that make you feel? It makes me feel bad because I'm not able to speak it. Right. Who, wants to, who wants to feel bad? So here's the question. I don't think we have time to, but think, just think about it. What is the unresolved trauma for our young learners? Why are they feeling bad? If you don't speak your language, if it makes you feel bad, what's the unresolved trauma? Whose fault is it? It's not theirs. They weren't, you know, you're not born speaking the language. You learn the language. And if you're a speaker and your children are in this situation, why didn't you not give the language to your children? Right? What's, whose fault is it? I don't know. That's something to talk about. At your home, your community, your schools. These are, you know, these are, especially for young people. I did a presentation to some UNM students. We spent 30 minutes on this slide. We didn't go anywhere because they wanted to talk about it. And that's the healing part that needs to happen, especially for young people. You know, we never ever hear from them. But look what, they, what they're holding in here. And that comment that was made, that's my oldest daughter, three years ago. And so for me, language revitalization is personal. Me, I gotta do it, okay? So, anyways. So for language uh, learning, uh, we talk about decolonization. It's a, a quote was made that language realization is a decolonization process. Decolonization means you start to deconstruct the Western uh, views, the Western perspective. A good example, I, I brought up this point to some elders, because elders are like, what's decolonization? Like in, and their thinking is like, what do you mean? They were, they were asking me in, in my own language, that word, that what does that mean? Explain it to me, us in the way we would understand it. So I explained it to them. 
They still couldn't get it. What do you mean? I said, okay, let me use an analogy. Do you um, celebrate Valentine's Day? I'm just using that because it's coming up, right? Valentine's Day. Uh, it wasn't Valentine's Day, but it was a holiday. I said, do you, do you celebrate that? And they said, yeah. Is that, is that the ne or is that Pelakana? Is that Western? It's not the ne. But why do we do it? <laughs> right? So how do you decolonize that? You know? How would you, the, the, the example I use is birthday. You know, birthday, we, we, you know, we, we gift a little three-year-old with all these presents and cake and we sing for them. It's all about the three-year-old. But in Diné, it's not, it, that's, that's a selfish concept. That's very narcissist, narcissist, is that how you say it? It's about the child. But in Navajo, it's rite of passage. When they're born, there's a ceremony we do for them. When they laugh, we do a ceremony, rite of passage, right? When they hit puberty for both female and male, there's a ceremony. When they get married, then there's another rite of passage. And then the last one, of course, is death, right? That's another ceremony. So that's how we celebrate in our way. It's not every year birthday cake, right? And so how do you decolonize that? How do you deconstruct that? And so when you have a five-year-old say, Dad, how many presents are you going to get me? Get me an Xbox. Get me this. Get me that. Whoa, right? And so that's what we mean by that, decolonization. And so the question we talked about is, what does this mean to you? And do you agree or disagree? Does it have to happen? And another question came up. Well, if, we, if we're expected to decolonize, then what? And my response is, then you reconstruct with your indigenous language and your indigenous knowledge back to your perspective. So you take out all of that Western ideology, put it over here, and take your indigenous language, your indigenous epistemology, your, your knowledge and ways of knowing, and you reconstruct it. That's your armor. And then that's where your paradigm shift is going to change. Then you're going to say, wow, this looks different. This, this is a little bit clearer. <laughs> right? So that's what we mean by decolonization and then reconstructing it, coming back to who you are, right? That affirmation, that validation piece. Okay. So from there, then we start talking about uh, engaging the community. What is language shift and what is language loss? And then one of the things that we talk about is uh, language loss and language shift. Earlier, I asked a question about vitality. There's some data out there for Dine speakers. And Dine, uh, there's a website out there. I don't know if it's true or not, how accurate that website is. is uh, the website is called Endangered Languages. Endangeredlanguages.org, I believe it is. And it, it, it looks at communities, indigenous languages in North America, even up here. So I went and found Tlingit and clicked on it. And it said 200, 200. And I, I believe it was uh, seriously endangered or something. You know, that, that more of the older grandpas and older adults were the ones that were speaking, not so much by the young ones. That's what they were saying. And so, we talk about that language shift. What does language shift mean? What does that mean? Shift. What's a shift and what's a loss? And so we have data in, in, from the U.S. Census where in 1980, 95% of Navajo homes were using the ne, Navajo language. In 2010, which is the last census data, 56% of Navajo homes are using the Diné language. It went from 94 to 50 in a couple of decades. If the trend continues by 2040, when I'm 70 years old, it would have come from 95% to 4%. That's a language shift. So in my lifetime, right, when I'm 70, I hope I'm still around 70 years old, right? In my lifetime, I would have seen from a 95% to 5%. That's a language shift. So don't tell me this isn't personal, right? 
And so those are things you, you have to think about. You have to look at your data, you know, who's speaking it, who's the language, where are we at? If we don't do anything in five years, what happens? Who are the speakers? How old are they? Right, those things, we need to take care of that. How do we, how do we sustain that? So those are things you, you have to talk about when we talk about language shift. It's not just data, it's what are you gonna do with it? You look at the data, yeah, it tells us this, but what is it not telling us? That's the other question you ask, right? And language equity. I think we talk, talk about this in, in, in homes, especially in homes. It starts at home. At home, that's, that's a very important piece we have to say. You know, think, think in the ne, speak in the ne, is, is what we do at our home, is speak the ne, think in the ne, and, and so on. And attitude is towards language. Uh, there's a lot of uh, what we call language politics. They, they'll say, I'm more browner than you because I speak my language and you don't. I'm more Indian than you. I speak the language you don't. Right? We, we, we do that politics with each other. And everybody else on the outside is kind of looking at us as, what are they talking about? What's wrong with those people? <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about. And the other side is that I don't want to be like you. I want to get my education, be a successful, blah, blah, blah. My language is keeping, getting me behind. Look at you, you don't, have, you don't even have a, a good living, right? So, you know, we play that politics. We play that politics, and that's what we talk about in here. And of course, language environment and the impact of the language of English, in this case, is English, you know? So you, not only do you have to define the role and the purpose of teaching your language, but you also have to f define the role and the purpose of English. We're not saying we don't want English, it has to be both. But what's the purpose and what is, how we're gonna do it, right? So both, you, you define it for both. Because there's use for it, right? Is there's use for it. So that's what we're talking about here. So these are things that you, you would engage the community in these conversations. Again, language, politics, cultural identity. That's a big piece nowadays. A lot of our kids are being, trying to be somebody that they're not, correct? You know what I'm talking about. They dress, act, talk, do different handshakes, blah, 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 you know, that's, what is the cultural significance with that? And, and so those things, you know, these are things that the elders talked about, not, not me. I'm still young, I'm only 25, so, you know, I'm a young guy. And so um, these are things that come from the elders. You know, this is where we are. We need, we need, to, we need to talk about a, what a, a good handshake is, not this stuff, you know, I don't know what that is, you know, what does that mean? What does the handshake mean? What does yat eh mean? When you see, when you greet somebody, yat eh, what does that mean? Ya means yat right? Creator, sky. Ya eh is, eh is mother earth, now son. Eh is perpetuates forward. So I greet you that way. Right? When you dissect the word, you know, those things you talk about. What does our language mean? What does it mean? How is it used, right? Those kind of things. So those kind of things we talk about, cultural identity. That's what we mean by cultural identity. What is the purpose of, these, of our young people to learn the language? And, and so an, a, another good example is we use our language to, to pray to the creator, to the holy people, because they're, they're the ones that gift us the language. We didn't learn it from an iPod or a dictionary or uh, anything. It was given to us. It was gifted to us. So it, it's their language, so we're going to use it to talk to them. We're talking, we're using their language to talk back to the Creator, to the holy people, right? That's a purpose. Wow, I didn't even think about it that way. See, this is what elders say. And these are good, good, good conversation. And of course, you know, talking about the expectation, really asking the question what does it mean to be? Clinket in 2020. What does it mean? How are you supposed to look? How are you supposed to talk? How are you supposed to behave? What are the values? What are the norms? You know, what does it mean? You know, if we're very clear with it and we share that with our learners, that's the motivation. 
oh, okay, this is what it is. This is how you're going to use your language. This is how you're going to do it. Right? Boom, there it is. It's very clear. It's a very clear path for them. And then it's easier on the teachers because then they, they know what the learning objective is, what the language objective is. Not, they're not just teaching from the hip. They know what the purpose is. And that's what we mean by language expectation. And it has to come from the community. It can't come from the school district or the school, right? It's you, the one that are speakers, right? I wish we could do another turn and talk, but the question is, why is it important to engage the community to, to talk about these topics, right? You know, I think by now you have a pretty good idea that it, it is important. It is important to talk about these things, to engage the community. And it's not something you just do two hours, one night, and here, we've got community input, let's go. It's an ongoing process. It's an ongoing process. It takes time. The work that we're doing with the community has been going on for three years now. And we're still trying to figure it out. It's, 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 it's good work, though. And, of course, you know, is there space for the school and the community to talk on these things? And you had to provide that space. You had to provide that time for it. And so on. So basically what we're talking about is this piece, right? This piece that we're talking about, the expectation. Once this is very clear, then you start to look at your community and your school. What a lot of people do is they come in here. We're going to give you a curriculum. We're going to give you a program. We're going to do this for you. We're going to have a program at the school without doing this. And after a while, they wonder why the school or the program is failing. Because this is kind of like, a, this happens, then this happens, then this happens, this happens, and so on, right, and so on. So how do we then engage the, 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 the school, defining the role of the community language and the community question, right, in the school and home? I think I kind of touched on these things. Is there a place for your language in the school, in the context of school? Right. The question is, I think somebody said it earlier, one of the parents, when we went to school, there was no language class. All of a sudden, 20 years later, there's language classes. Who, who put the language in our school? Who did it? What's his name? Where does he live? No, I'm kidding. But you, know, you ask that question, why is it in our, in our community? What's the purpose of it? And is it used to, to teach academic content? Is it used to, to you, you know, if you're going to teach geometry, do you have a word in, in geometry for, in your language? Do you know what a parallelogram is? You know, I don't know. That's, that's something you have to talk about. Um, and then, of course, what is the role of parents, community members, teachers, administrators in doing all of this? So these are questions you, you have to talk about. And sometimes you don't get to the third one because you, the first question might be, the, the first point might be, there isn't a place. Let's leave it at the community. You know, if that's what the community decides, so be it. Right? And so on. So here, what we're talking about is, is uh, when we talk about language revitalization, is, it's not about us as speakers. It's really you know, thinking two or three generations ahead, this idea of the seventh generational concept. So in other words, this is you here, your parents, your grandparents, and your great-grandparents. Their language and their knowledge has been transferred on. Because whatever you know in your language in your community came from your mom and dad, right? You didn't read it somewhere in a book. Mom told you when something happens, you do this. Dad tells you this is how you do things, right? And so all that knowledge was passed on. Even the stars, right? The communication with nature. That's through research, through indigenous research, that knowledge has come up. So the question is how do you then gift it to your children, your grandchildren, and your children? your child's grandchild, and so on. That's the seventh generational concept. So the idea is, how does great grandmas get to this? That's language revitalization. Right? It's not just about you. It's not about 2020 right now. It's about boom, and then looking back. Okay. And of course, what are the language expectations for your learners? They'll say it's our identity, it's who we us, it's who we are. It's gifted to us. We didn't learn it from a book, we didn't learn it from an app, right? Our language is sacred. And we want oral language development. We want to produce speakers. That means no reading and writing. 
Let's just get on with it. One focus. Let's take care of that. Let's go. You know, let's let's not just shoot in the dark. We know where we're going. We're gonna do it. I think my time is up. Is my time up? No. Um, intergenerational transfer of language. Again, indigenous education involves the child and parent and grandparent. How do you how do you make a community effort grounded in their community? It's who we are, where we come from, and language revitalization is is about future generations. It's not about just the you and just not the now. It's thinking forward. And of course, uh, again, is about future speakers, not current speakers. So that's what they're talking about. So these are things that came from the community. This is what we need to do. Let's go move with it. And from there, you begin to validate it. You know, validate and, and adopt that. That these are, it's gonna be unique for you guys. It's gonna be unique for tribal communities across indigenous communities. And speakers of the language. You know, if you're a speaker, you have a role in this. How do you make the live, how do you make the language come alive again? The issue of vitality, right? Do you, do you purposely greet people and try to stay in your language as much as you can? And so on. Supporting young parents who are not speakers, historical relationship with school and community needs to change. That idea of, of parents support us, right? We need your support here. It's like, how can the school support you? That's a different, different, different approach. And of course, uh, supporting indigenous language teachers and program. Just because you speak the language doesn't mean you're an effective teacher. I'll just put it out there, just like that. And we often get into this trap where schools say, oh, you speak your language. Oh, be our language teacher. Nah. -uh. And the reason we say that is because we're very careful to do that because if you're a speaker of the language, the, the young kiddos that you're going to be working with, their language is second language. You don't know what they're going through because you didn't go through what they went through, right? You don't know the challenges and the struggles of learning another language. Because you, are, you, you, you were immersed and you learned it. And then we turn around and tell them, oh, you know, this is how I learned it. Yeah, but that was you. <laughs> this is different. This is different. So think about that. So that's what we mean. You know, speaking the language doesn't really make you an effective teacher. Right? There's, it's, you know, it's, it's good to speak the language, but thinking about those things, right? And then, of course, using the community language assets in the community. Who are your speakers? I, there were some grandparents in the school. That's good. Bringing the community into the school, that's good. Uh, I would just go on to say, you know, utilizing assets, you just have to be very purposeful with it. You know, there's a purpose for it. Just don't do it off the cuff, you know. Define those roles. What is the role? What is the, what, why are they there? Make them useful. It's one thing to put them in there, but, you know, if they're not useful, then they're like, okay, what am I doing here, right? Those kind of things. And I guess at the end, the question is rethink if the community language should be in the school or not, right? If, it, if the vitality of the language is not within the community, maybe that's something you might need to work on first. So going back to what I was saying, if I go around telling people, communities, you know, this is what we should be doing, but yet in my own home, <laughs> if that's not happening, wait a minute, I gotta rethink this, right? So that's the kind of thinking that they, they told me, the elders. Who are you to come in here and tell us about our language when we know that your children don't even speak it? Ooh, how do you react to that? Of course, I took it with good heart and I said, thank you for your criticism, whatever. And it's not criticism, right? It's, it's reality. So I had to rethink that. Re redo that, and it's hard. Well, a lot of language teachers, they'll say, You're, you know, why teach the language when your kids don't even speak it? Wow, you know, it's like telling a, a science teacher, why do you teach science when your, your child doesn't even do well in science, or <laughs> whatever, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of like what I was thinking about. Anyways, things like that. So basically, what we're saying is, engaging the community, having those conversations, from there you begin to plan the approach, how are you gonna do it, and then, and so on. So uh, a lot of times schools don't do this. They just start here. We have money here. We have a grant money, right? We have grant money. We're going to hire a teacher. We're going to have a program. Boom, let's go into school. And they, they start here, and they're wondering what's going on. 
And that idea of one hour a day, right? That should be talked about first, right? Is that the right approach? And so on, okay? So basically what we're trying to do is move that shift, that paradigm shift. Once you have a narrative from the community, right, in terms of cultural linguistic expectation, then schools be begin to defend that, man that mandate or that narrative, not the federal or state mandates. Because that's the first thing principals are gonna to say to you, administrators, sorry, I can't do that. The state wants us to do this. Well, you don't, you don't exist here because of the state, you exist here because of kids from the community, right? And so on. Language asset resources are within the community and trust and believe in your local language and knowledge. Because that's how, what has sustained us for me all these years. And we're still here, we still speak the language, you know, despite all that has happened, right? Despite all of that, we're still here. And we're survivors, we're resilient. We should be proud of that. And that's because of our language and way of knowing and the knowledge. So real quickly, here is, I don't think you can, I don't know if you can read it, but here's a narrative that a community came up with. It addresses the impacts of colonization, what it, what it is, colonization, all of this impacting the community. And a quote that came, we, we, we have lost the motivation to speak our language. We don't even plant corn anymore. Because corn is, is a lot of the teachings come from the corn. That's what they're saying here. Our teachings in the corn. We don't even plant it anymore. Wow, right? And then they're saying, reaffirming that our, our ways of knowing in epistemology. Our, lang our language is, is gifted to us. It's sacred. What they mean is that our language is holy. It's is, is sacred. We just don't loosely use it. We just don't loosely write it. We just don't loosely do with it. However, it's bahastik. Right? Take care of it. That's what they mean. And then, if you speak the language, you're thinking in the neck akwan sahak case. The neck akwan sahak case is that decolonization. You no longer think Western. You think in your own language. That's what they're talking about. Right? This is all elders, community people. And at the end, speaking and understanding the language is an asset. That should be, right, that's, who, that's what our expectation should be. Not PhD, not middle class, mortgage, few family incomes, a fancy right, nah. -uh. Speaking the language, that is the goal. That's success. And here, what they're talking about, that's a it's when you have everything. Well, in Western, it's like you have, you have you, all your bills paid and blah, 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 right? Right? But in, in this community, it means when you have the language and the cultural knowledge that's irreplaceable, that defines you, that's who you are. You're wealthy. That's what they mean. You're wealthy. You have wealth when you have that. So aspire to that. Learn it. Listen to your elders. That's what they're talking about, right? So that's what this narrative is. And then, of course, community expectations, right? And the urgency. What they're saying is you need to start early. It's oral language development. Focus on everyday language, intergenerational conversation, fluency in both language. You know, we want both the net and English. Purpose is, is to teach the language of self-identity. They need to know who they are. The role of the English language is to support young learners locally and globally, right? And everyone in the community needs support in learning the language. And this is what we want. Any school that supports it, this is the way it should be. Navajo is full immersion. You start to go down, you go 50-50, equity in language. Equally, uh, equal delivery of language and recognize that both language, English and the net are an asset. This is the community narrative. This is, this is what we want. Give this to the school. Let's see what they do with it. Right? And then at the end, the intergenerational chance, the urgency, in order to sustain our future generation, is the responsibility of current speakers to gift the language to our children and grandchildren. Not give them birthday parties, but gift them the language. 
right? Because that's where the wealth is. That's what they're talking about, right? And so on. You can read it. And if we don't do it, who else is going to do it for us? It's an inherent sovereign right to be who we are and speak our language. So if you do this narrative, this is what you call an act of sovereignty. A community took something and do it their way and wrote their narrative and said, this is language sovereignty. It's not about gov language or not sovereignty in the sense of government, right? This is what you call sovereignty. When you actually do something for your own self. In Navajo, it's up to you. But at the end, what we're saying is that, you know, uh, language revitalization is, and here's just a real quick uh, a cap, what we call cap. Uh, so, you know, this is the 50-50 model. So this is what it looks like, but we can talk more about it. This is more just stuff. And of course, they're using different strategies. GLAD is one of them. This is what they use. Uh, they're getting away from the reading and writing. A lot of it is a picture, oral conversations, and so on. So very little writing, okay? So they, they want to focus on oral language. And these are taught to three or four year old kiddos. And this concept is really complicated if you understand the language. Shema, what does my mom look like? How would I know what my mom is? What does she do? You know, there's a lot to this. And you can just go crazy with language. We're in a relationship with grandparents, Che, my son, grandparents, and siblings. This is very complicated, it's very complex but they, they're using it with their kiddos and the kiddos are learning the concepts and they're learning the language. Three-year-old, four-year-old. I was amazed, like, wow, this is crazy. Yeah, it's good, yeah. kind of good crazy, right? So with that, uh, I'll just end with my, I think I went over 50 minutes. Um, I think I had said this earlier in, in the radio broadcast. Uh, this is, again, uh, earlier too. This is very new, language revitalization. We're faced with it. It's here. Um, I, I, you know, the answers are not out there. They're not in Stanford University or Harvard University. It's not there. It's here. It's within your community. It's within your language, within your knowledge. You have it. And the only people that can do something about it is you. Right? You can do it. And we can help you. And we're here to help you. We're not knowers. We're learners just like you. But, you know, as you can see what a community can do, that narrative, and they want to expand on that. They want to make manuscripts. They want to tell their story. And this is what, what they're going to leave for their children. Because at the end, what they said is, I don't want to be known to be part of that generation that failed to give my language to our future generation. I refuse to be part of that generation. And then we're here, right, if you're a speaker. So it's very, it gets very personal, right? Language revitalization. It's not in the curriculum. It's not in the classroom. It's here. It's really where it is, okay? So uh, thank you very much for giving me this time to talk to you, and I hope I didn't offend anybody. I apologize now, but uh, this is all in good intent. Uh, I failed to ask the elders for permission to speak because I, I normally don't talk like this act or talk like I know everything. I'm just a learner like you guys, so. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So, Gunish I did forget to mention at the beginning, this is a time for discussion and questions. And so, I would like to invite you all to come up to the microphone, so that way people who we are videotaping can hear the question. Um, and so please come on up, um, keep the discussion going, ask some questions. We have a little bit more time.
I'll break the ice. Okay, that's fine. Can you tell us a little bit more about the specific instructional strategies in terms of second language acquisition, how to support that with teachers, how to support it with second language learners? Um, what are some specific strategies that you all help support um, through your professional learning? And why is that really important for, um, for language teachers to know and understand? I think I might need some help here, Mike. <laughs> um, that's, that's a very a couple questions I think in there. One is, um, I guess when, when it comes to indigenous language, one of the questions that you would have to ask teachers is uh, um, if it's oral language development, right? If, if that, let's say that's the goal, then the question becomes, what is the approach that you're going to use to teach oral language development? So here's something that we throw out to, to language teachers. Are you teaching the language the way you learn English? Right. Let's think about that question. Because in English, you're, you're taught article, noun, verb, and what's the at the end? Predicate or whatever, right? That structure. And English could be probably described as noun base, right? And so the question then becomes, are you teaching the language the way you learn English? And the way you learn English from the get-go is A, this is A, A, B, K, right, and all that stuff, the, that alphabet sound. And so that's something you, you, you would probably engage in, in, in the, with the teachers, those conversations, right? How are you, how are you, to, what is the approach? What, is, what approach are you using? And the second one, again, is ask that question about, um, do you know your students? Do you know your students, or, or is, is language their second language? And, and, and so on. And kind of get that idea and, and kind of get that um, awareness or knowledge or whatever information about your kiddos. And so then, then that helps you to define, OK, I guess we need to learn about second language acquisition, what's in the, the theories behind it. And so on, and so, and those are things you can take in regular coursework, you know, and, and, and stuff like that, because there's a lot behind that. There's a lot behind that, and then we're, we're talking about focusing on language, right? Focus on language. So, in other words, in in English, we talk about um, like uh, bricks and mortars, right? The 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 words that are voc main vocabulary. And, 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 and indigenous people, indigenous language, you know, they kind of follow what their second grade teacher is doing because you have vocabulary words, right? And then in indigenous language, they'll do vocabulary words too. And, and then, then you have the mortar, right? The words that connects those, like the transitional words and things like that. Does that exist in, in your language? Right? So talking about your language, that meta-linguistic awareness, talking about like, how is your language structure, how is it, and so on. So from there, then you're going to help to say, OK, we need help in this. We need to help more understanding in this. So how can we support that, and so on. And so that, I think, is, is probably uh, um, and along with the community expectation. right? If the community expectation is oral language development, OK, let's put literacy aside and just look, look at what is oral language development. How do you do language oral development? And then, you know, looking at different strategies, there's a whole, you know, a number of strategies out there like immersion, um, you know, all these different uh, strategies that they throw out in there. Uh, but GLAD is, is one, is also a strategy, guided language acquisition. But one of the things that I, that I caution teachers is, um, Strategies are strategies, you know, but look at it from your from your language perspective. Okay, learn if you understand how your language is, then you can look at it from that perspective, and then use that strategy to help your your learner, right? And that's 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 something to think about. So we're not. Um, you often hear this. We're going to indigenize the strategy or we're going to indigenize the program. That's just a structural change. 
But when you use your indigenous perspective, that's a cultural change. That's where the main thing needs to happen, is the cultural change. So you can have all these different programs and different strategies, but if you don't understand your language and if you don't know how to approach it, right, you're going to be doing the same thing. It's just going to be hitting the brick and brick and wall. And so I, I think what I would just say is that for indigenous languages, you know, try. The only way you're going to know is you're going to try it. The only way you know. And that's how this lad work that we're doing says the only way you're going to figure it out is you, you got to try it. And the reason I say that is because for years, you have all these different mandates that come down. They'll give you money for it, early literacy, whatever. What is it, reading to learning to read, all these things that come down. And they usually have all these requirements to it, right? And everything, and then here's the money with it. And you have to follow it with fidelity. You got to cross the T's and dot the I's, right? And all that stuff. Well, that approach never works because it's, it, it, it confines people. They're not allowed to think outside the box. It confines people. But the best approach that works is if you figure it out on your own, and the way you only figure it out is you got to try it. Oh, yeah, you're going to fail. Oh, shoot, this didn't work. Let's try it this way. Let's try it. That's the only way you're going to know if it works. Guess what? That's indigenous research. That's how our ancestors did it. They tried it. It didn't work. They tried it again. They figured it out. Blah, blah, blah. Right? They studied their surroundings. Yeah, they made mistakes. But they figured it out, and that's how it works for them. And that's, that's, that's probably the best way, is when you leave people, leave it alone and let them figure it out and, and, and work it through. And that's probably the how I would, you know, think about indigenous language. You know, you have all these strategies. Good, go, go, go take these training, bring it back, but look at it from your perspective, from your language perspective. Because some might work and some might not. And people would say, well, that's not, that's not indigenous, so it's not for us. No. They're only talking about structural change. It's the cultural change. That's, you know, so. Because that's, that's, that's how we... That's how we learn the language, right? That's how we learn. Mom didn't say, okay, we're going to do immersion now, <laughs> right? Right? You know, we're going to do this process grid for you. <laughs> you know, they, that's, that's, not how, that's how, we're not how we learn the language. Yeah. I want to, th <clears throat> I want to thank you for one of the most, if not the most insightful presentation on this topic I've heard. I'm on the Juno School Board and we're in the midst of attempting to support revitalization of the Tlingit language. And all of what you've given us this evening has been insightful and relevant to that and, and, and to our function on the board especially. One of the many challenges we face is that, that I was reminded of in your presentation was when you spoke about how there's a kind of a tension between trying to build a, use the language to, a, to support the community, the Tlingit community, uh, and traditional educational metrics of success like test scores and making sure that you're crossing all these T's and dotting all these I's in the, in the traditional Western educational setting. Do you have any advice for us for how to get the administration and the professional staff more comfortable with letting go and, and trusting that the, the, commu the Tlingit community will, will make progress without burdening them with all of this infrastructure that's not really very appropriate? There's a lot of unease about that. Um, I guess I would just share a couple things that I think in, in our community conversation, and I think I, earlier this morning we had some parents that we were talking to, and I kind of talked a little bit about that. And one of the things is uh, schools, of course, you know, the, the institution itself, they're held accountable for test scores and blah, blah, and, and that's good. That's fine. We're not trying to change that. It is what it is. 
But in terms of language, you know, I, earlier I showed a slide about historical trauma, yeah. right? So just imagine if the school would support our young learners with language and, 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 the, and the, the question about what is the, what is the unresolved trauma, right? If our young learners are beginning to heal and do away with that trauma through the language learning in terms of, of, of spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, right? How, just imagine how if a child wanted to be in school, yeah. they know who they are, they're validated, the school validates who they are. Just imagine how much more they would be successful, not just in education, but in life, mm -hmm. right? So that is the, the thing that I would say, is that's how it's gonna be, that's how it's gonna impact the achievement piece. That's how it's gonna impact, because if you have children that are grounded in who they are, and they're proud to be who they are, and the school and everybody val validates them, man, they're gonna give you not only 100% more, but more, right? They're gonna, they're gonna perform, you know, and for the teachers know this, once you have those kiddos here, they'll do anything for you, right? Because yeah. once you validate and affirm who they are, I got those students right here. I'll tell them do this for me, and they'll do it. You know, it's a test. Oh, I hate tests, but you're gonna still. Do, oh, I will do it because it's Mr. Warito, right? And they'll do their best. And so that's how I would say. You know, it's it's there's there's a it, it the result would be that it will impact student achievement yeah. because that's part of the cognitive development, right? But thinking about that other piece. And, and that's how the language heals, it, heals us. Because you have a young parent that was saying, oh, I'm so happy, and it, it made my heart feel good to hear my children use the language. And I was sitting there, I was like, wow, that's healing happening right in front of us. That the language can heal a community. And the way it's going to heal, it's going to be the young ones that are going to heal us. It's going to be that young, those young kiddos that are learning the language, singing, Man, it's going to heal the grandparents. It's going to heal the community. And that's the gift of the children. Right? That's the gift of the children. And so that's how I would say to, to, the, to, the, to the board and the community that you know, we need to do this, we should do this. And, and, and so we're helping the community. And it's better to have kid, kids that are not feeling bad to speak the language, that feel proud to speak the language. Because we want to change that, right? We want to change that. And if they're there and happy to do it, they'll do it. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, how can I phrase this without overlooking the influences within the community of Juneau on up to Yaktet, Wrangles, Petersburg? Ian Clinkett, Ida, you know, Simshan influenced that's a lot of symbolical trust within our um, family crests and things that you'll see within our uu, our regalia. And without those things, wouldn't really transcribe the definition of song and dance being from up north or being you know, inside passage or mainland and having Filipino right there amongst the Norwegian saying their terms of endearment being our um, great or our grandparents to help embrace what us Clinkets all are enduring to give the proximity of certain forms of discussion through protocol in our language to be recognized by others without overlooking where they're initially or originally from, I think is one of the biggest challenges I have to consider and accept being from Yakutat coming into Juneau and having so much more influence in Juneau by all these other neighboring villages than being predominantly of the Akhtet area, which is 250 miles north. And so having to look at how one group says one, and then another group says two, and then apply that to how we see an ovoid or um, raven's tail weaving to basketry done in which form that allows us to find um, that ind indigenous trust of uh, not just materializing it or speaking it, but being able to perform and dance it. That's one of the things that kept me in relations to 
um, the language of where I was influenced, but along with my strength are being uh, reevaluated personally by being um, somewhat of an instructor to the youth, but because of all the joint efforts, they're giving me new understandings of introduction or presentation of where they're already surpassing things that I was never instilled to the now confidence in my introduction. And then to have them teaching me the new way of it uh, kind of keeps me, of course, learning more, but how, how do I structure that primary hello without overlooking these other people? They're all within you know, the grasp of the panhandle, but when it comes down to specifying being from a particular area, some of us are having to delude ourselves by giving that extra sacrifice, knowing the cost. You know what, I could turn that into a direct question for you, other than knowing that there are things that represent the old void through form line design that honors a structure and a, a sensor protocol to, um, the neighboring uh, tribes and villages. Beyond you know, that question, <laughs> that's even one. I, I I guess the way I would kind of think about that question is 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 because I am not I'm not aware of the local community what you were talking about earlier some things like that. But it, I I think one of the things that I talked about was. Um, I guess what we call language politics or the politics of communities and, and things like that. And, and, and that's something that if you really think about it, is something that is a, an, an approach that was, that's, that's not of us, sort of, right? Because um, um, that's, a, that's, that's a different concept that, that has been given to us through, through, I guess, colonization or through intergenerational. And somewhere along the line, it, it just became uh, something that just became the norm, becomes the norm, right? And, and so on. And so um, I know back home, we, 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 we talk about those things. We talk about, you know, you're not saying it right, or this is the way it is, or in this community, it's like this, and so on. And, and so I think that's why it's, it's, it's crit critically important to say, to engage the community in, in you almost have to define what the community is, also, and and so and and so in, in this in this area, who is the community when it comes to the Tlingit language, right? Who is it? And so you have to almost have to define that, because that word community doesn't really exist in our way of thinking, right? In our way of thinking, and so in in this uh, community that we were working with, they had to define who 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 was the community. You know, who can speak for this? Who can speak for that? And so on. And then, of course, you have all these interdiverse diversity that happens and marriages of Christianity, all these different things uh, that people do. And, and so at the, end, at the end of the day, they all say, okay, we're going to just go around this and beat, it, beat around the bush all night. And we're probably not going to get anywhere. But let's all agree that the language connects us all. Right? It would be the language that connects us. Yeah, we might say it differently here, differently here, blah, blah, and the way it's used, it might be different, but the language connects us all. And the example they use is, let's say you're in an airport like Chicago, and you're waiting to board, and all of a sudden you hear another person speaking, and it's that person is speaking your language. What are you going to do? You're going to jump on and go over there and say, where did that? Where's that coming from, you know? So that sense of place, that the language is not only our identity, but it gives us that sense of place. And, 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 and that sense of place could be here. It doesn't really have to be with this. It could be here, right? And so it, that's, that's, I guess, how I would try to answer it. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to answer the question, but I'm just kind of giving you that perspective, okay? Okay. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that 
the uh, in in learning uh, a language, the language, uh, a heritage speaker in a school setting, let's say, um, I think is what you're referring to, might not be the most ideal person uh, to instruct a set of students maybe learning the language. And there might be a disconnect from somebody that has that language that they, that they know uh, from birth um, and trying to teach that to students that their first language may be English. Mm -hmm. And that relationship or that, that connection might be a little bit um, difficult for them to, to you know, fit into. Um, and maybe uh, it, it seems also like y y you were saying that a heritage language speaker might not have necessarily the tools uh, to teach and instruct a group of students uh, for, for, that, for that second language. Um, so and in some cases, I, I understand that for sure. So um, going back to that then, um, how can a heritage language speaker be supported in a school setting when trying, when the goal is to try to pass that language on to the students? How could that initial, that heritage language, or language uh, teacher or heritage language speaker be used in that, in that setting most effectively? Or maybe what is the best role for a heritage speaker um, wanting to help and that overall goal of creating more language speakers um, within a school setting, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, anyway. I got your question. I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> give me, give me time to process that question. <laughs> um, I guess the, the, the. Let me just throw out some things for, for you guys to, to think about first. One is that oftentimes, and, and I don't know, I haven't been in the school here long enough to kind of think about or know about this, but in some, some school districts, what, what would happen is uh, the, the, the language program or the language class would be in the back of the school in a school portable, right? And, and so they're kind of like, they, in, in essence, they become the stepchild of the school or the district. That's how teachers view themselves, literally view themselves, you know, when, when, when the school doesn't really support our program. And, and earlier, I think the conversation was when it comes to budget, our language program is the first one to be cut, right? And so, you know, and, and so on. And so I guess, uh, uh, one of the things that I would I would probably put out there in terms of thinking about your question is that um, in the, the expectation and the expectation in terms of, of lang heritage language teachers one is that um, um, I, I think I said this earlier um, just because you speak the language doesn't make you an effective teacher you know that's I'm not I'm not saying that's true across the board. There are there are teachers, there are language teachers or language speakers who are good teachers, right? There are good teachers, um, but I think it's it's more around the approach, the approach that you're using, in terms of what is what is the objective here. So, in other words, uh, what is the learning objective and what is the language objective? Right. A lot of times we we're just trying to teach a concept or a content. We're just focused on la uh, learning objective, but we're not thinking about what is the language objective. So, in other words, uh, you know that having those conversations with teachers, and and really diving deeper in, in, into those conversations with teachers. Um, the other thing is that uh, um, modeling the language, right? Modeling the language. It, it doesn't just have to be just a heritage teacher. It should be uh, people who are from the community. So in other words, what I'm, what I'm talking about is there's a school that says through the community conversation, what, what the community said is, we know that there are people that work at the school that are from the community that speak the language, 
But when I go into the school, they choose to speak to me in English. I know they speak my language, but they speak to me in English. And I try to speak to them in my language, but they continue to speak to me in English. But then when they're outside the school, down at the local community place, then they speak to me in my language. <laughs> right? And so what, what does that mean, right? What does that mean? And so um, I, I, I think uh, the idea of, of what, I guess what I'm getting at is we need to start thinking about getting away from, from this idea that the language teacher has the sole responsibility to teach the language. You know, that they're a part of it, but they're not the only one, right? They're not the only one. And it's, they're a catalyst to what we, we can do, they can support. So the question really is, how does the language teacher really support the community? Because it's not, you know, because that's what we often think, right? That language learning only happens, or learning in general only happens when I drop off my kid at the school and go, go learn something. And we come back, oh, okay, get in. what did you learn today? Oh, okay, blah, 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 that's it. And then we don't, we don't engage in our children. We don't do parenting. We don't teach them anything, right? We just let them do whatever, and then next morning, drop them off, go learn something. We pick them up. What did you learn, right? That's, that's Western education, right? <laughs> that learning only happens from, okay, it's 8 o'clock. We need, we need to start teaching. We need to start learning. Oh, it's three time, time to go to school. Okay, kids are like, Oomph. learning. They shut that off. They, they're kids. They, you know. And so I, I think there's a lot of things to really think about. That is that that cultural change, right? That cultural change that we we keep talking about. And so um, I think um, the support for for language teachers. Um, if the community expectations are very clear, then I think that the, the heritage language teachers feel not only validated, but they know there's a support coming from the community, right? And so I, and once that is clear, they, they know. So for example, this community narrative that we showed, we shared it with the staff. This is what the community is saying. And everybody in that, here's, here's what happened. The language teachers were very quiet, but when I'm talking to them in another room, they're like, we need this. We need to get the school to do this, okay? But then when you put them in the, in the, with the other staff, they don't want to say anything, right? But once we show the community expectation and the narrative, this is what the community wants. This is the expectations that they want for the language learners. The certified teachers, right? The non-native teachers looked at that once they understood it and they said, we should go do language, like what the community wants. We should put our, the community language front and center. We should model it. Right? It was the non-native teachers that said that, and then everybody joins in. So just think about that. Just think about that. It's a very interesting thing that, wow, I, I, I I would think that they would be advocating for it, right? And, and, and so that, that's the politics and the dynamics that we're talking about. And so um, there's a lot to it. I, 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 I think uh, um, one is, is that uh, here, here's another thing to think about because I, I think this is where a lot of language teachers are. If the students are not if their language and their culture is not being affirmed and validated by the school, and you're a language teacher, what does that make you feel like? Are you in the same boat as those kiddos? Because right? the kids know. The kids will know if the principal validates their language and culture. The kid will know, right? And if the kids know, just imagine what the teachers are going through. And would you want to be there, right? And so those are some things I just throw out there for food for thought, I guess, is what I'm saying. Uh, I'm not trying to give you clear answers, but I think the answers and, and those solutions are, are within you, with all of you.
to have those conversations and to say, do you really feel validated? Teacher will say, yes, of course. I get this and I get that. But then you ask the teacher, uh, the student, do you feel validated? The student, no, I don't. Right? So what's going on here, right? What's going on here? Okay. <laughs> that was really awesome. So Patrick, as we were walking through the schools today and I was thinking of, um, you know, what, what parting gift can we, can we leave with you um, that highlights the culture, the tradition, um, the values of this place? And what can we leave with you? And I thought about the conversations we were having about the books. And so, David, would you mind coming on up and talking about this? So what I understand is um, you were looking at these, uh, these books and, and, and looking at them and appreciating the, the value of uh, some of the books that uh, Sea Alaska Heritage is, uh, has been creating to... Um, perpetuate and, and uh, encourage young learners of the language. Uh, the imagery and, and the, the, the thought and um, you know, the words that are put into it. And it's resemblant of the, the, the vision and the, the imagery that you are up here spreading to everybody and and your images are out to us to write in our minds and we see those images we see those images we hear your your words and we we have the same um, dedication and drive and and vision that you do and so we're taking your vision along with our vision that we have at Sea Alaska Heritage and kind of gifting them back to you. Okay. So these, these are, <laughs> okay. that's kind of a weird way to say it. But anyway, um, this, is, this is a gift uh, to you from, from Sea Alaska Heritage uh, to remind you that your vision is, is there, and we see it, and, and it's ongoing. It's ongoing, and it's... Uh, Thank you. Uh, for a moment there, I thought you were going to say, we're going to write a book on you. As, as, oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, just last thought I just want to share with you. Um, um, my, my inspiration is my mom, right, my mom. And uh, I lost her five years ago, five years ago. And uh, one of the things that, that she would talk to me about is uh, um, my, my, my legacy. In, 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 in our way, they will say, what are you going to leave for your children? You know, what are you going to leave for your children? And, and, and all of this conversation is in Navajo, right? In, in my language. What are they going to carry on? It won't be uh, your home, your degrees, whatever. You know, it, 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 it's, what is it? And so that always reminded me of that. Right? My mom, right? My mom. And so... Uh, you know, it's it's uh, when when we got here, I you know, I was I was thinking about what am I going to say, and uh, but there's there's she's always there, she's always there. So when I said earlier, when I said yat e tahasilo, tahasilo means um, all all that's in all direction, all the beings. So I'm I'm when I speak, I, I'm very careful in what I'm saying. I'm speaking from the heart. Because you're not the only one that's hearing me. It's my elders, my ancestors that have gone on. And my mom's always, I always envision her. She's always sitting there, listening to me, what I'm saying. And this, what I'm saying is really her teachings. These are her teachings. I want her to 
sit there and go like this. I taught you well, good son, right? And so that's what we say, that's what we mean. So we're careful that there's others that are listening to our ancestors, right? That have gone on. Later, it's a thought, and your mom's sitting there listening. So don't, don't be good, you know, because what you're saying is her teaching, and you want her to go like this. Good. You make me proud, son, right? So thank you very much. I appreciate it.